Hello everyone, the day is Thursday, August 22nd, 2019, and this is The Week in Charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending this week. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up all predictions or about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what do we talk about? Well, I think the elephant in the room remains the market. So I'm going to focus on that. Obviously, your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them to the slides. And I have quite a bit to get through, but it, it shouldn't take me too long this week because a lot of it's just going to be a rehash of what we've talked about lately. If you don't mind, and this is for your benefit, wait until we get to the charts before asking about individual stocks. And then once we're there, just ask about one at a time. And I'll remind you of that when the time comes. So what do we talk about? Well, I want to continue again on the market timing, where we are in the current market, and do an update on all that. And raise the question or continue to ask the question, are we on winter watch? So is winter still coming? As you know, that bastard Jon Snow complained about winter for a long, long time. And it took forever to get here, but it finally did. So the question is, are we back into the woods? So let's first take a look at the 10% system update and I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because I beat the dead horse in this over the last six months or so but you want to buy in the market is 10% away from its less than 10% away from its 50 week closing high and the last two lows are greater than the 50 week moving average that's the entire system right there for the buy side you want to exit when you're 10% or more away from the 50 week closing high and the close is less than the 50 week moving average that's it so this is what the results look like based on this, and I'll show you the last buy signal and some times when the market has turned bullish and bearish, bearish based on the system. My little coon, my little coon ass just slipped out. I said bearish, <laughs> bearish into parish, as we call it down here. We don't have counties, we have parishes. So let's take a look at this system real quick. Now the idea, although it does beat buy and hold, the idea is is not to beat buy and hold in and of itself. I mean, that's great that it does, but the idea is to avoid what I call, or Ian McActivy calls diaper change moments. And a diaper change moment is when you have a very big loss over a fairly short period of time, or even over a somewhat longer period of time. As I preach, you lose 50% of your money, and you're getting ready to retire. You've got some hard decisions to make. Like, as I was saying, the ideally, you want to be buy and hold. And, and when I went into the system, that was the ultimate goal. But quickly, my focus became avoiding these diaper change moments that Ian act to be. I said it right there, calls them. And that's when you have these really big losses. And the diaper change here, this is how much money you would have avoided losing by getting out of the system. So you exit at this level here, 1374. And then the market goes all the way down to 775. In this particular case, in 2008, You'd have gotten out of January, in January at 1401, and you would have avoided a 52% drop from there. But Dave, you developed a system after 2008. Yeah, I know, but I had a lot of systems that were developed way back in 2000 and, and before that would have showed you sim similar results. And all I'm doing here is just showing you that a simple system can work. Now, the last sell signal back in 2016, you can call that a whipsaw, but the market did drop 11%. And as I said in prior weeks, let's say you got a million say for retirement, and within a short period of time, you lose 11%. Well, that's $110,000. If you saved and saved and saved your whole life, squirreling away a little money, especially if you've got a wife, a kids, a mortgage, college and all these other things 
then $110,000, that might have taken you, it might have taken you a long time to accumulate. So psychologically, that could be a pretty big deal. So even a 10 or 11% drop, I think is significant. But the big thing you want to avoid is these huge diaper change moments. You want to get out of the way. And I beat the dead horse again on this system quite a bit. I'm not selling you a system. In fact, I'm giving it away. I'm like, Oprah with this. You get a system. You get a system. <laughs> couple of things, though, the, the point I'm trying to make with all this is that simple trend following, simple systems can work. And what's kind of interesting is like, well, you're in the market 24 and a half years. Yeah, but you are also out of the market over six years. One of the arguments, and it's a rather poor argument, is that, well, if you... If you try to market time and you miss the 50 best days in the market, then your returns are, are crap. I was like, okay, well, I hear you. But Greg Morris has turned, it, turned that on its head and many other people. And if you miss the 50 worst days, you would beat the S&P by some ridiculous amount. Now, there's no guarantee you'll miss all the worst days, but based on the way the system works, if a market is to drop 50%, okay, it's going to drop, what? It's going to drop 10% first. And that's when, oversimplifying things, but that's when you look to exit. So anyway, I know I beat the dead horse on this. If you have lots of questions, if you're watching this recording and have, I know everybody here live is probably rolling their eyes because I talk about this so much, but I get a ton of questions on this. So if you're watching the recording of this, go back and watch the last several. Oh, uh, did that thing come back up? Watch the last several week of charts, and you will be able to, you'll know everything that I know about the system. So this is what it looks like. And down here at the bottom, what I've done is I've programmed a ribbon. And the ribbon says, okay, if we're within 10% of the 50-week closing highs, and this is illustrated up here, you can see this is a 10% line. So we're within 50%, I'm sorry, within 10% of the 50-week closing high. And you can see here, I plotted the 50-week closing high. Notice that it made a new high here. And then it makes a new high here when the market begins to make a new closing high. But once you get up here and then the market begins to pull back, that high remains in place until and unless it gets taken out. Now, on the downside, as I'll show you in one second, it will begin to catch up with price rather slowly, but it will eventually begin to catch up with price. So the bullish ribbon is programmed to say, OK, if we are less than this bogey line up here, this 10 percent line and you have at least two lows greater than the 50-week moving average, in other words, what I call Landry light, then stay long. So if you're above this green line, which is simply this programmed onto the chart, and I have another chart which shows it in one second, then you want to stay long, provided that you are also closing above the 50 week moving average. All you need is a close to stay long. Now, let's take a look at the rest of these warnings and signals. So you could see you had a warning as the market began to pull back because you intersected the 50 week moving average. The other way for that warning to come up or that neutral, so to speak, would be for the price to get more than 10% away from the 50 week closing action. And you can see it went neutral. And then you ended up with the sell signal back in, back last November. Now you can argue that that was a whipsaw because by the time you got back in, you actually bought right back in just a, a smidge below where you sold. So you really didn't save a whole lot by doing that but you avoided a fairly sizable slide, as I pointed out in the spreadsheet. And then right after you bought, you got a warning, and then it went back to relax, then you got a warning. Why? Well, you got a warning because you intersected the 50-week moving average, and you actually closed above it one week, 
close below it one week, I should say. The market went on to make new highs, and we're still in relaxed mode. I know, haha. -ha. The reason I want to spend time or continue to spend time in this system here is that it is a longer term timing system. So I wouldn't sell the farm just yet when it comes to longer term investments, but when you see a neutral, or a warning, however you want to look at that, then you might want to start thinking about taking some evasive action. Now, keep in mind, we trade off the daily chart, and in doing such, we're going to get stopped out long before this thing triggers, and that's perfectly fine. And I'm going to talk about your portfolio being a microcosm of what might be going on, maybe something much bigger picture. So as you can see, bullish here, it's green, and then it went neutral for a little while, back to bullish, and the market began to slide a little bit when it went neutral. You had a sell signal here. You had a little bit of a throwback higher, went neutral first, and then it went back to being bearish. And then you had the market, the market began to rally. Now it's not gonna jump in right away because it's a trend following system. There was some lag involved in fact i sort of programmed a little lag into this on on purpose if you try to reduce all lag you end up chasing your own tail so whipsaw filters help to keep you from chasing your own tail and you can see it turned bullish went neutral for a little while and now we're back to being bullish check back often though so this is what it looks like longer term you can see for the most part it's bearish and neutral doing downtrends, bullish and neutral and uptrends. And then occasionally you do get a whipsaw. Now, as I've said quite often, even though those are whipsaws, you have to get out the way. Well, first of all, you don't know it's a whipsaw at the time. You don't know it until after the fact. So the old hedge fund adage, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day comes to mind. And in some of these cases, I think you were stupid to just blindly hold on drinking that buy and hold Kool-Aid. Now, again, the last sell signal really didn't materialize too much, turned into a whipsaw. That's okay. It was pretty ugly, or I should say the 2015-16 signal was pretty ugly. We had a lot of signals trigger back then, and actually my chart is eh, it's about right. I thought it was a little bit off. But we had a lot of other signals triggered in 2015, 16, and the market did go down fairly hard from those signals. And this was just a confirmation signal, was a little bit late to the game, as sometimes it can be. And then it went back to being bullish and neutral, and we had one little bearish whipsaw when, if you go back and look at the slide I just did, actually turned out to be a little bit, pretty much a break-even type of move, which is nothing wrong with that. Getting you out of the water, getting you out of the water, getting you out of the way for a potential big slide, which didn't materialize. And as I've been saying quite a bit, it's just another piece of the puzzle. As some of you guys in the Facebook group have been doing, taking the ball and running with it, I think that it could be the start of something much bigger. And I'm going to show you an experiment I'm doing with Bitcoin, a live experiment. If you're under a buy, then you want to focus on the long side. And then if you're under a sell, you want to be selective on the long side and consider shorting. Now, as I said a second ago, you don't want to wait until you have a signal to begin taking some evasive action on your existing daily positions. But if you do have a sell signal, you really need to think long and hard about whether you want to be buying or if you're under a sell, so to speak, if it's bearish. Now, again, the designer's intent, as I've been saying quite a bit, is for the overall market. 10% is based on the general overall market volatility basis, the S&P. I figure that's a pretty good round number. I'm actually going to show you it in Bitcoin in one second using 30%. So for other markets, it may be higher or lower. It depends on the volatility of the market. For individual stocks, I would prefer to just use a core methodology. If you're looking at sectors, ETFs, and the overall market, then yeah, by all means, plot this indicator 
to give you a little bit of help, a little bit of reference. But for the most part, you want to follow that core methodology, and you especially want to follow that core methodology in individual stocks. Now, I have been experimenting, experimenting with it here and there just to kind of give me a little reference in my charts and to kind of help me in watching the momentum. Now, as I've said last week, a couple of simplified systems. This is the net net price change, and it's going to be a little bit better than this because I didn't update my charts from last week, figuring you'd still get the idea. It's only going to be maybe 1% or so different from this. The point being that you can go back to last August, and we're actually slightly lower than we were back then. So even though we had some pretty serious zigs and zags in between, for the most part, the market hasn't made any forward progress. Same thing goes for, that was the NASDAQ, here's the S&P 500, and we'll take a look at that in the live charts too. Now, this is really simple. All I'm doing here is if the low is greater than the 50-week moving average, that's upside Landry Light. If the low is less than the 50-week moving average, that's downside Landry Light. And you can see just this silly little indicator in and of itself, highs less than moving averages, moving average on the downside, lows greater than moving average on the upside, can keep you on the right side of the market. Now, if you squint your eyes, you can see in some of these big bear markets, you had a little bit of red, but not much. And the way I discovered the Landry light in the overall market with the 50 week moving average is that I go into presentations or comes from the fact that I've gone to presentations where people talk about these great systems and then it seems like they almost always have a moving average plotted. And I noticed when the market trends, just paying attention to the Landry light would keep you on the right side of the market. For those who want a little trivia, Landry light comes from an article I wrote in 1995, I'm dating myself here, <laughs> uh, which is the left side of this chart. That's hard to believe. Talking about using a, two, a 220 EMA breakout system in the Japanese yen. So it goes way back to then. And a CTA befriended me and he called it, he actually it was somebody else that befriended me, but a CTA also befriended me at the same time. That's why I'm getting my stories mixed up. A CTA befriended me and suggested that I talk to Larry Connors and see if he wanted me to work with him on some research. And then the other gentleman decide, uh, thought that the, the Landry light, which he called Day Light, which became Dave Light. Anyway, long story endless, right? So he called it Daylight, because you can see the light between the moving average and the price. And then it later became Dave Light, and then one of you guys suggested I call it Landry Light. Because like John Bollinger, I need to start putting my name on stuff. Now, the weekly bow ties are pretty cool. I'm a bit of a nerd. But you're just looking for that 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential on a weekly basis to cross over fairly quickly on the downside after an all-time high or a multi-year high at least. And the last signal did not trigger for those keeping score. However, if we get another signal and it does trigger, I would, I would pay careful attention to that. What's the old saying? The early bird may get the worm, the second mouse gets the cheese. And on the upside, we had a fairly early buy signal in 2003. And it took a while for the moving averages to catch up in 2009, but we had plenty of other signals triggering at that time. Now, I'm often asked, hey, Dave, can I use this on a five-minute chart? Yes. Hey, Dave, can I use this on an hourly chart? Yes. Now, you're going to have a little bit more noise, but you do have the advantage of possibly getting in early. And I know some of you guys talk about specifically Jim, I think, mostly, but you, you guys talk about hourly bow ties in the Facebook group, and I appreciate you guys pointing those out when you see them. And in this particular case, this was the S&P 500 at the end of July, 
formed an hourly bow tie down and it triggered. So that's the sell-off that we saw since all started with an hourly bow tie. It doesn't mean that every hourly bow tie is a mother of all tops, but often a top will start with an hourly bow tie. So patterns or fractal. And you can see again, these moving averages crossed over fairly quickly. And then it triggered a sell signal about 298 and hit a pretty good run lower. Now, here's where we are on the daily chart. So you have, after the crossing, the market has to pull back. By the way, it's also a first thrust, meaning that you have a thrust down in the market from all time highs, ideally, or at least multi year highs. So you may all-time highs here, nice thrust down, followed by a pullback. So the first thrust would have triggered here. The bow tie, after the crossover, you have to wait for a higher high and a higher low. So that would be on that bar there. And then the trigger on that would be the following bar. And so far, we've had a little whipsaw back up. Hey, Jim, good to see you. Okay, you should have a video again now. Uh, it should be fixed. So let's take a look. Well, before we do that, it's kind of a, I need to, I'd ask my wife to tell me, see if she could find a receipt, but she bought me this bear and somebody suggested I put a bow tie on it for the entrance to my office. And I said, babe, that's a little negative because I like to be bullish. But uh, she said, well, maybe you could put like an arrow, an up arrow in its arms. I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. But this is how it came except the bow tie on it I added after the fact that the one of you guys suggested I put one on it, which I thought was kind of funny. Anyway, so hopefully that wasn't an oven or um, harbinger, is that a word, for things to come. Now, the other thing to realize is, yes, we have all these sell signals and such, but I would pay attention to the fact that we are stuck in a range and that's why you've seen me show some shorts lately in the landry list but i haven't gone after any just yet and that's because so far the market is just meandering back and forth between 28.25 and let's say 29.50 for me to actually get excited about this market it would have to go on to new highs and stay there and then for me to get a little bit more bearish, it would have to get below this little bit of support we have down here about 28.25. For now, other than gold stocks, IPOs, and opening gap reversals, as I'll talk about in a few minutes, I've been pretty much sitting on my hands. I'm gonna talk about that too. So I think it's okay not to do anything while the market is finding its way. All right, any questions on the market time or anything before we go from there? So that's current S&P. Now, as I said last week, I think your own portfolio can be used as a microcosm of something much bigger. Many times I'll have a portfolio filled with momentum stocks, and then, bam, I get whacked on one, and then, bam, I get stopped out on another. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? Before I know it, I'm stopped out of all of my stocks. As I think I said last week, I used to maintain a list of 100 stocks and I wasn't using actual real money. It was more of an experiment, but I kept up with it for years and kept many notebooks on this for years and years, but it finally became too much work given everything else I had to do and I kind of got the idea. And all I would do would be to add a stock to the list if it made new 52-week highs, ideally on an expansion of range. And then I would take a stock off the list if it began to perform really poorly, or if I had so many good-looking stocks, I would let it get pushed off the bottom of the list. And to my amazement, or I was amazed at how it sort of printed money when the market was going up, and the momentum game was working well. Unfortunately, as you might know, momentum often ends badly. As I often say, I was listening to Mike Moody once speak about relative strength, and I raised my hand. I said, Mike, I have noticed and experienced and felt the pain many times when trading relative strength and momentum that 
it ends badly. And then he calmly said, Dave, if you're going to have a baby, you're going to have a lot of baby poop. So basically, that's his way of saying it comes with the territory. Babies are great, but you're going to end up with a lot of baby poop. And so that's how momentum works. And the momentum back in the Landry list would get whacked just out of the blue, would get whacked in the market, the overall market, S&P 500 be up like a half a percent or maybe down a quarter percent. And the NASDAQ would be flat or maybe down a little or even up a little. And that list would get whacked. And then the next several days, over the next several days, the overall market would get whacked pretty hard. Now, I don't have the time or energy, but just thinking out loud, maintaining that would probably be a good thing. And then when it gets whacked, <laughs> look to possibly short the market over the next several days. I don't know. Maybe on a day trade might be worth a shot. Now, again, use your own portfolio as a microcosm of something much bigger. Again, especially when I got a portfolio full of momentum stocks, I begin, I begin to get stopped down in them all when the market begins to turn. So the model portfolio, the service portfolio is flat, and that's what it looks like right now. That's a snapshot. There's nothing up there. The reason you see all those values, those are just formulas that need to be filled in once we begin adding stocks to the portfolio. And I'm still only long. All I have, I'm probably 95 or 98% long. I'm sorry, I'm 98% flat. All I have is the GSX trade on right now plus the GBTC experiment, which I'll show you in one second. So you really want to listen to the database when it speaks and listen to your portfolio. If your portfolio is flat or you're getting stopped out of things, you might want to just tap the brakes a little bit if you're bullish. Pull on your horns a little bit if you're bullish and wait for some follow through. Listening to the database is another great idea. If you can't find a long to save your life, then you might want to think about just sitting on your hands. If all you're seeing is a plethora of shorts and you can't find any longs, you might want to think about shorting. If you can't find any setups that you like, and my litmus test there, very scientific, is the F yeah test. If you're feeling like, F yeah, I got to take this stock, then by all means, take that stock. But if you're not, if you're feeling anything less, then back off. Just this morning, there was an opening gap reversal. It looked okay. I thought about it, thought about it, but I just didn't have that F yeah feeling. I didn't have a feeling that I could, that I, if I didn't take it, I would be like bummed out. I felt like, so what if it takes off without me? It's just not the greatest thing. And it's not the greatest setup in setup town. And I also want to look good. And usually on these opening gap reversals, we discuss them in Facebook. And if I'm going to talk about one, I want to make sure that I'm going to make a lot of money on it so I look good from my ego standpoint. So that throttles me back a little bit from taking mediocre trades. Now, lately I've been seeing quite a few shorts, and the only thing I'm seeing on the long side of value is gold stocks. Now, again, as I said earlier, if you're going to use a 10% system in other markets, you're going to have to adjust to the volatility of that market. And again, on individual stocks, I prefer using my core methodology. In IPOs, I have a few other setups, one of which I'll show you in just one second. But if you are looking at Bitcoin and some sort of index, and, and to a lesser extent, maybe a sector, possibly bonds, it might be a good idea to look at something like this. But it's in general, stocks Stocks in general, I should say, I would focus on the core methodology, pullbacks, TKOs, and things like that. But if you're looking at something like Bitcoin, I think they might be something worth while here. And this is my live experiment using GBTC. I don't like GBTC because it trades at a big premium, which is fine until and unless that premium comes off. But I know some of you guys are trading it because you don't have accounts set up with the Bitcoin exchanges, and I'm making little air quotes, which you can't see, because those Bitcoin exchanges, I use that term loosely, and it seems like nearly every one of them has gotten into hot water, and luckily some of the bigger ones have been able to bail themselves out, pay the clients off, hush money, whatever you want to call, 
call it. So not not a big fan of the lack of regulation, but I do trade the majority of the cryptocurrencies through the exchanges. And I'm using Kraken and Coinbase. Now, if you guys have other ones you like, let me know. There was one I almost got into for a third exchange, but they got into a little hot water, so I decided to back off. Anyway, the 10% line I have drawn in here is for the S&P 500. Maybe bonds or some other markets might work well with 10% too. For Bitcoin, I determined, at least based on recent volatility, that it would take 30%, believe it or not. Like, Dave, 30%, that's a lot. That's crazy. It's like, well, that's what it takes to trade something like this. The 10%, you would, this thing moves 10% in one day, so you would be chasing your own tail if you were trying to trade a system like this. So here we have the 50-day closing high. And again, like I said earlier, if the market makes a new closing high, a new 50-day closing high, notice that line goes up. Now, what's kind of interesting, I'm a big fan of closing highs as opposed to actual highs. Don't get me wrong, I still look at actual highs, but the closing high is telling because the market actually ends there. Notice here, this closing high is way up here, but this line stayed flat, and that's because it did not close. It closed down here. It did not close a new high. However, on this day here, it closed a little higher, so notice we went up. We still didn't go past this high until we had a close way over here, and then we have a close that's a new closing high that's also above this high. And then again, you can see highest close is here, even though you have a high up here. So that's this line tells you where the new closing high is. Notice that in downtrends, it's going to continue to drop. And then eventually, it's going to take a while sometimes, especially if the market drops pretty hard, pretty fast, but it will eventually catch up the price. And then this little line is just. 30%, okay, instead of 10% like the S&P, 30% below this line. So if you measure from here to here, do the math, it's just that line times 0 0.70 or 30% lower, however you want to look at it. And you can see that we've come dangerously close to this line over here. And notice that we went from bullish just recently, meaning that the lows, at least two lows, are greater than the 50-week moving average, 50-day moving average in this case, to neutral because we have closed below the 50-day moving average or intersected it, I should say. It's probably a better way of putting it, okay? Now, notice we have one day of Landry light. If the next day we would have been up here, then this would have gone back to bullish. So now we're kind of in neutral wait-and-see mode on the Bitcoin, but what's kind of cool is this thing went long way back here, okay? So way back here, it went long. Let me put the arrow back here on this day here at about, what, four bucks and a half. And then, you know, you had a pretty good run up, but of course you had a tremendous drawdown, but it comes with the territory. And I wrote a few months ago that I was having a blast trading Bitcoin because I just didn't care. Whereas my other accounts, I might be a little bit more serious because they're much bigger. In this account, I'm just having a blast. And then I was able to ride out a 30% drawdown or whatever it was, a little bit less because I took partial profits as, as it rallied. But still, the drawdowns are invisible. And I'm just kind of following along like a good little trend follower, I'm not following the system exactly, except in the GBTC. But I'm kind of using it to guide me on staying, whether I want to stay long or not. Anyway, so that's the TFMM or the TFM 10% system. And again, there it is. There's your buy way back there. A little green arrow just popped up. And then again, we've gone back to neutral. All right, in my personal portfolio, the only thing I have left is this GSX trade. We talked about this one last week. All I did here was with the IPOs, what's my rule? I have to wait five days before I even think to trade them. 
or the earliest I would look to trade them, this is day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. The earliest I would think about trading an IPO would be to close on day five. But in this particular case, this thing was not doing anything. So I waited. And then with the five day SMA system, you need what? You need Landry Light and a new closing high. That close must be the highest close of week one, which would be actually right here. However, if the high is set on day one, it must also be above that close. So very simple system. Close must be greater than the highest close for the first week. And a, a greater than or the high of day one. So it must be the greater of, close must be greater than the greater of these two things. So if this stock would have came public, and let's say this high was down here, then you would have bought right here because the new close high was above the highest close for the first week, okay? I've talked about this at nauseum. Go to my website, davelander.com. I talk about it a lot in the members area, and I talk a lot about it in the Q&A. So become a member, and then you'll, you'll have plenty on that. Pretty simple stuff. One trade would pay, one good trade pays for it all. And then if you are a gold member, I know as soon as I say it, 10 people are going to try to join. You must be a gold member, but join Dave Landry Trend Traders. In the space. It's my Facebook group, private Facebook group. It's on the members page. And when I see these Landry Light setups that I like, I will toss them out into the Facebook group for what it's worth. And we have been talking about quite a few IPOs fairly recently there. So the buy again was at 12.90. The initial profit target was two points above that 14.90. Stop was down here, two points below. The stop gets raised to break even when that initial profit target is half is is hit. Half of the shares are sold. So the worst I could do, barring overnight gaps, is to break even on the remainder which is better than poking your eye, and hopefully, and I know I just said hope, but hopefully trail a stop for a long, long, long time. And sure look good this morning, but then it's since come back in. That's okay. Now, if you're watching me and you just met me and you just joined the Facebook group and you're all serious about trading, you're like, this guy only trades a certain way. And you might think if you've been watching me, if you watched me a couple of years back, 2015, and even in late 2000, I think 18, you'd be like, well, this guy just shorts a bunch of banks in other stodgy stocks like insurance. And you might think, well, this guy just plays a bunch of opening gap reversals. This guy buys a bunch of energies coming off of all time lows. He trades pullbacks in small cap tech stocks. He trades short-term breakouts in brand new IPOs like the GSX. He trades small cap gold stocks, and he doesn't do anything. So it depends on when you look at what's happening. I was talking with someone yesterday, and I was saying, geez, you know, this Facebook group lately has morphed into the opening gap reversal report. And that's all we're talking about is opening gap reversals. And he said, yeah, I know. And a while back, we were just talking about IPOs because that's what was still hot. And it's possible, as he mentioned in a few, a few days ago, that maybe the IPO market's been in heat up again and we might have some new opportunities. Now, I'm also going after some gold stocks right now. I haven't triggered into any, but I have orders in place. So you're thinking this guy trades IPOs, or at least did recently. He's trading a lot of opening gap reversals now, and now he's looking to trade goals. That's all he does. Well, pretty soon, if this market continues to roll over, 
then you might be thinking that this guy just trades a bunch of banks and other stodgy stocks. So these big cap stocks that are at high levels, priced for perfection, are beginning to roll over, you might see me start shorting some of those. So keep in mind that depending on what the market is doing, it will appear that I only trade a certain way, but there are quite a few things that I do. 99% of them are pullback and trend related, maybe 1% or 2% of them are breakout, and that's in the IPOs, longer term at least, and then maybe a fraction of a percent are things like opening gap reversals. So again, this was the IPO breakout pattern. So that's the one I'm still long, the GSX, knock on wood. Here is opening gap reversal back on August 1st. We talked about that one. That was a textbook opening gap reversal. And then again on August 19th, I was playing some opening gap reversals, and that's the trade there. Now, intraday, it ran up, we took partial profits, and it came right back in. At least that's how I played it. And here's a gold stock. Looks kind of interesting. So this is what we're looking to go after now. This is on the service, so I'm not allowed to, or out of courtesy, I should say, to the service peeps. I'm not going to tell you what symbol it is. But there is a buy, and it's based on a TKO pattern. You can see that big knockout bar in there. So far, it has not triggered. So when I say the church of what's happening now, I mean that in a positive sense. One of my friends many years ago, he's an Indian guy, but he doesn't talk like an Indian guy. But anyway, he, uh, he talks like the Henry Kissinger type of voice that I often <laughs> imitate. He's like, if they found out that intravenous drug use was on the rise, he would be buying hypodermic needles. Like, well, I, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, drug use isn't on the rise, is it? But you do want to be in the mindset that you want to trade what's hot and be patient with what's not. If you go back a year or so ago when that Bitcoin bubble happened, I was all over Bitcoin. And then nothing happened for a while. I took partial profits. I got stopped out. And I waited and I waited and I waited. And then finally Bitcoin began to take off again. And all of a sudden you see me pipe up on the crypto. So you have to be patient when the market's not hot, whatever that market may be, and you want to trade what's hot within your methodology. So you don't want to system surf, and I see it happen all the time. People come in, try to trade my stuff, it's like oh, this guy doesn't do anything, or he's just trading small caps, or just trading whatever, and that might not be working fantastic. So they'll go off and chase rainbows, and then of course, I'll hit a big upswing right after they leave. They're off chasing rainbows, and they end up perpetually out of phase. Now, what's worse than system surfing is chasing gurus. And that's especially if it sounds too good to be true. I was looking at a video from one yesterday, and I, I nearly had to throw up. It's like he said each one of his picks is worth at least – $500 because you should make 50% on it. And if you have a $1,000 account, that means $500 for every pick that he throws out. And if you don't make five times your money within a year, if you follow every signal, then he'll make sure that you do. He'll help you to make sure you do. It's like, wow. <laughs> really? Okay. Well, let's, let's see that happen. So you got to be careful. So again, join the Facebook group if you haven't already done so, provided, of course, you are a gold member of DaveLandry.com. Donald says, my current portfolio is similar to yours, currently in GSX and a leverage bond fund TMF. Yeah, I like the TMF. Um, I hate to say this because I'm going to get myself in trouble, but uh, if I wait for the best of the best opening gap reversals and stuff like TMF, I almost always make money, and almost is the key word in that sentence. But that's a market that does trade fairly cleanly. It's efficient, fairly cleanly in that being efficient if you have an opening gap reversal 
it can work out quite nicely. And I'll show you a couple of those too. I think I did have a scratch trade there recently, so I may have jinxed myself. Uh, TMV. TMF. If you guys want to open up for individual stock questions, feel free to do so now. I'm trying to think when my trades were here. I have to look. And also the TMV sometimes can work nicely too. I think that one good trade was like right here. And a lot of times when you have a nice trend, you'll get some really nice hoping to get reversals here in the TMF. I'm not a big fan of holding these leverage ETFs overnight. Let's take a look at the major MIGs. Starting off with the P's. Yeah, keep the uh, individual picks coming. A little softness today, outside day down, not the end of the world. But we are like right at the cusp of this top of the range. So that's a little bit concerning. You don't want to chase your own tail. But seeing a market range bound like this tells me that I might want to center my hands, except for something like gold or some other sector, maybe bonds. Who knows if they set up outside of the overall market, something that's going to have a non-correlation or won't be correlated to the overall market. The outside day down a little bit more obvious in the NASDAQ, down a little bit more than half a percent, almost three quarters of a percent. No big deal, but obviously we want to get out of this range, and obviously at some point the market has to go back up, otherwise it could be in trouble. The Rusty remains a major disappointment, as you can see, so far today, outside day down. More importantly, what the Russell is, if you back the chart way out, so far, it has a big picture retrace look to it, meaning that it looks like a big top remains in place because it hasn't made it back to its old highs just yet. Your routine, though, take things one day at a time, as I preach. Energies, you don't have to be a rocket surgeon to see. Not doing so great in here in a downtrend, approaching their old lows back in 2019. Gold, I'm sorry, metals and mining overall, sands, gold, and silver, not looking so hot. Just draw your big blue arrows. Gold itself, or gold the stocks, I should say, within metals and mining, looking pretty good so far. Nice uptrend remains intact there. Ditto for silver. But as you go through these other areas... You can see they're not doing so hot. It's kind of interesting. Consumer down durables is considered a defensive area, and it looks sort of like the S&P itself, not looking so hot. So, so far, there's not a flight to safety. I suppose if the market was really selling off hard and these areas, at least on a relative strength basis, weren't doing better, I would be concerned. But it is a little interesting that you're not seeing a whole lot of rally and these defensive areas just yet, although the foods, I guess, are doing okay based on the overall market today. Banks, you can see pretty serious slide in place so far, just pulling back. So that looks fairly ugly. Insurance stocks, hard sell off. All of these areas, by the way, or nearly all these areas have bow tied down, bow tied down like the SP 500. Real estate kind of hanging in there. Now might be a good time to jump to bonds and take a look at those guys. And that might because, be because rates or low bonds up means rates down. What I would do here and what I have been doing is I would look for an opening gap reversal. Ideally back in the direction of the trend, but you can see that I did play two of these in here in the TMV. And if you pick your spots carefully in something like the TMV, as I was kind of alluding to earlier, you could do okay with these opening gap reversals. And this was a nice little trade down here. Even though it's a contra trend trade, it's only a day trade. And sometimes the market gets so oversold, you could do fairly well with these gap type trades down. So that's bonds. Let's take a look at a couple other areas. Transports, as you would imagine, with the overall market not doing so well. Transports are doing so hot. 
And then you got hardware and software and semiconductors. All of these areas have kind of rolled over in here and so far they're doing just a little bit of a retrace. The semiconductors really scores is a bummer because it was just breaking out a few weeks back or a month or so now back, but then it came right back in. This is why I don't get too excited when the market first breaks out and that's why I always say follow through is key. Okay, let's take a look at financials, and I think we're done here. We'll take a look at the dollar, too, while we're at it. As you see, financials have rolled over recently. If you put the bow ties in, we should have a bow tie down. Not quite off of all-time highs, but fairly close to multi-year highs in here, as you can see. So that's certainly not a good thing. Let's take a look at the dollar. The dollar appears to be – hang on, that's not the dollar – the dollar appears to remain in a nice uptrend, just shy of these multi-year highs. So, so far, so good for the dollar. Let's take a look at the yearly chart. Yeah, based on the dollar index, which I don't know if it tracks the dollar perfectly, but it's good enough. It's a good proxy to use if you don't have futures and uh, Forex charts. But you can see the dollar is right here at multi-year highs, and that might be all-time highs, at least based on this. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, it's pretty close to all-time highs. Now, this UUP, you'll have to Google it, but last time I Googled it a few years back, 20 years ago, I guess, if Google existed then, was it Alta Vista back then or whatever, the UUV was based on a basket of stocks. How far does this go back? Just to make sure I'm not just making something up here. Let's see. It goes back quite a ways, so maybe it wasn't Alta Vista back then. But anyway, so that's a dollar. All right. Keep the uh, questions coming. PVG. That's gonna. That sounds like a gold stock. Um. It looks okay with the golds. I would prefer, if possible, to find some that are coming off of major, major lows, like all-time lows in their first big rally. But this looks okay. I mean, it's just getting past these prior peaks in here. It's not bad. I would ideally maybe like a little bit more knockout. Shorter term, I, I hear you, Zach. It's been in a nice resistant uptrend. It's began to accelerate higher a little bit. I'd actually like to see a little bit deeper pullback, but that's not bad. I would also go through the remaining goals and see if there's anything you like a little bit better. Maybe something that's not just right at these prior little peaks in here. Like I just said, I kind of like it when a market gets past prior peaks decisively. And that way, it's less danger of a false breakout. All right, any more? Got quite a bunch today. Well, while we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Any unanswered questions, you can go to davelander.com slash contact and fill out the form there. Questions requiring a lot of thought, I'll do it. I'll cover them in the Q&A. And if it's your first time asking a question, I'll give you access to the Q&A. And if it's something a little bit easier to answer, I will cover it in the weekend charts or maybe even answer directly. All right, everyone have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk between now and then, thank you so much.